buluyorsunuz? YouTube'yu başlatayım da. Evet. Hocam başladı e, sanırım YouTube yayınımızda. Hocam e, öncelikle Daran Hocam hoş geldiniz e, ve diğer e, tüm katılımcıları. 85 e, görüyorum şu anda Zoom'da. E, yine aynı şekilde e, muhtemelen YouTube'dan da e, katılımcılarımız olacaktır. E, muhtemelen yabancı e, katılımcılarımız da var. Ben İngilizce yapayım girişi. E, bir participant... E, Welcome to uh, Seminar of Department of Economics and uh, Yıldız Technical University. Today uh, we have a very special guest. Uh, we are going to welcome uh, dear Professor uh, Daran Acemoğlu from MIT uh, Department of Economics. Uh, he's now in the uh, MI, uh, he's now at uh, MIT and uh, before that he was in England uh, for his education. He received his uh, master and PhD degrees uh, from uh, London School of Economics uh, and also uh, in his early life. Uh, He was born and uh, lived for a, a while uh, in Istanbul. And uh, as most of you know, uh, Professor Acemoğlu uh, is an internationally uh, recognized economist uh, with his works. Uh, I think uh, not only economists, but uh, also many people uh, from every walk of life uh, know him with his uh, two famous books, uh, especially Why Nations Fail and uh, The Neighbor One, uh, Narrow Corridor. Uh, of course, addition to this, uh, has, he has a really uh, fascinating career uh, along with significant uh, numbers of books and articles. Uh, articles. So, Professor Acemoğlu, today we will make a presentation. I think uh, it will uh, take around uh, 45 minutes. Uh, you can ask your questions by raising hand and turning your uh, microphones on after the presentations or during the presentations. Uh, if it's okay uh, for the professor. And uh, we have a time limit, by the way, uh, around uh, one hour. Uh, we will have, uh, I think, around uh, 15 minutes after the presentations for uh, questions and discussions. Uh, also, uh, we will follow chat boxes in Zoom and YouTube. Uh, you can uh, write down uh, on chat boxes and uh, then I will direct the questions in order. Uh, professor, uh, it's, it's your time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anıl. Thank you, Fazıl. Thank you, Sema, for the invitation. Çok teşekkür ederim uh, davet için. Uh, burada olmaktan çok mutluyum. Let me continue in English. Uh, so, uh, it's my pleasure to be joining you. Uh, I grew up in Istanbul, so I know uh, Yıldız Technical University and uh, even visited it when I was in high school. So, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a true pleasure to be joining you. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some new work that builds on uh, a series of papers and new approaches that I have been developing with Pascual Restrepo on the effects of new technologies on productivity and inequality. So this paper is entitled Tasks Automation and the Rise in US Wage Inequality. And I think the reason why it might be a good sort of uh, uh, topic for us to discuss today, it will give me an opportunity to summarize some of the main ideas, new ideas that may not be familiar to most of the participants and also build on some new empirical and theoretical results. The motivation for this work comes from the phenomenal changes in the US wage structure, which are summarized here for 10 demographic groups, men and women, and five education groups, all the way from those without a high school degree to those with a postgraduate degree, such as master's PhD or uh, uh, medical degree and so on. These groups all uh, had above 2% real wage growth, fairly shared prosperity during the 1950s, 60s, and in the 70s, but since then you see a huge increase in inequality, but more strikingly, you also see the real wages of many low and middle education groups, including those workers in gray who have some college, two years of college or associate degrees, both among men and women actually decline quite significantly. This has been one of the motivators for a large literature on wage, wage and labor market inequality. A lot of that literature and some of, the, some of which I have also contributed to in the past, either takes the standard skill bias technological change view 
which is that new technologies take the form of increases in AH that are complementary to skilled workers' age, and that as a result increases inequality, or capital skill complementarity, meaning that there is capital deepening, more equipment is introduced, but that equipment is not equally substitutable to low and high skilled worker. As a result, high skills workers, more complementary uh, labor is augmented more and inequality increases. These two technological perspectives have some interesting implications and some, of course, explanatory power. But one thing they imply is that inequality may increase, but wages of low, your low skill workers wouldn't decline because, you know, technology is complementing all sorts of workers at the end of the day. Labor market institutions have been changing and trade has had an impact on inequality as well, but none of this really accounts for this very striking declines in the real wages while productivity is increasing. Uh, and, and that is where I think a new perspective is necessary. And that's what, you know, Pasquale and I and some of my other work has been have been trying to build over the last 15 years or so. And at the center of this is what we call automation technologies, technologies that take tasks previously performed by labor and allocate it to capital. Since time is short, let me give you, and I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on the theoretical framework because I think without the theoretical framework is where some of the novelty is. So it's a very different way of thinking about production that might be useful for other people to use. But also you need the theoretical framework to appreciate the empirical work. So let me jump right to the bottom line and show one part of the empirical work already. And this is a summary of where I'm gonna build up to. Each one of these dots corresponds to one of 500 demographic groups defined by age, gender, uh, education, and ethnicity. And on the vertical axis, we have change in hourly wages from 1980 to 2016. On the horizontal axis is what we call the task displacement. Essentially how many or what fraction of the tasks that this demographic group used to perform in 1980 have been automated. And you see a striking relationship. Essentially, 70% of all of the changes in the US wage structure can be explained by whose tasks have been automated. And critically, as you can see, both the prediction and the actuality is that many groups had quite a large fraction of their tasks automated, more than 20%. And when that happens, you actually don't get the benefits that are implied by the standard theory, but in fact, decline in your real wage. And this is what we're going to try to sort of understand. So I'll uh, talk about the theory. Let me not summarize it since time is short and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it step by step. But the key here is how task displacement happens. And that's very different from the ways in which the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the profession has typically thought of about the effects of technology. So that will require us to develop a flexible but general alternative theory of production. And then I'm also going to show you a lot of empirical results showing that uh, that pattern I depicted in the figure is quite robust. But there also are interesting issues about general equilibrium here. So in the last five minutes of the talk, I will, because this part is a little bit more technical, I will give a whirlwind tour of how you can actually do more general equilibrium analysis and counterfactual incorporating some of the thing, some of the economic effects that are absent in the reduced form analysis. All right, so let me start with the theory. By the way, uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions if anything is unclear. As I said, I'll leave uh, 10, 15 minutes at the end for uh, Q&A and discussion, but I do welcome questions as we go along as well. All right, so let me start from a single sector. And this is the most important slide really to understand this slide. And, and then uh, the rest of the theory is, you know, implications of the slide and generalizations. But output in a single sector, for now just only one sector in the economy, is produced by combining a set of tasks. Tau or T here is the set of tasks. And all of the tasks in this set are combined with a constant elasticity of substitution lambda. So the dx is the integration over the set and yx is the task services. So if you want to produce a piece of garment, you need to do weaving, skinning, uh, spinning, weaving, design, uh, chemical processes, coloring, 
and then a whole host of marketing, advertising, retail, wholesale, and transport tasks for a piece of garment to actually receive, uh, to, to reach its, uh, its, its destination. So we're going to assume that each task can be performed by either capital or one of G types of labor. So the G types of labor are like, for example, those 500 demographic groups that I was showing you earlier. And at this level, this is fairly flexible, except that uh, the production is linear. So linearity is an important and simplifying assumption. It doesn't actually matter too much, but it makes things much more comfortable and uh, tractable. The important issue is that there are different types of equipment. You need a computer to do design and you need a, uh, a, a drill to do drilling. So different types of e equipment. So KX is capital of a different type. And in producing task X, it has a productivity Psi KX, as well as a general factor augmenting productivity AK, AK, which we include because that's the type of technological change that the previous literature sort of focused on. So we wanna nest that and show how other types of technologies are very different. And then similarly, the uh, labor of type G, LGX, some of it is allocated to this task. It has productivity Psi GX, task specific productivity, and, and a general factor augmenting technology, AG. Capital itself is produced. Uh, it costs QX units of the final good to produce a capital of type X, and the supply of labor is fixed at LG. We look for a competitive equilibrium, which can be shown to be the one that maximizes net output in this economy. Net because you have to subtract what capital costs from output. Actually, this framework has a lot of interesting implications when combined with imperfect labor markets and rent sharing, but I'm not going to go there today. So that was the slide that explained everything, but here is a visual representation that also helps me introduce another key concept. So here is an example. This is the task set. And I'm focusing on an economy with three types of labor, capital, labor G, and labor G prime. An equilibrium is going to be defined by these boundaries that separate this task space into three. These tasks are allocated to factor G, these to G prime, these to capital. And then a key concept is I'm gonna integrate the space of this area that's allocated to G, and I'm gonna call that task share gamma G, it's really just the, the area of this, but it's weighted by psi g to the power lambda minus one. So if lambda is close to zero, to close to one, this exponent here is close to zero. It's just the area. But if not, then you weight the ones that have greater productivity somewhat less when lambda is less than one, which is the realistic case here. So in this, tasks are generally complementary. So think of lambda as like a number like 0 0.7, 0 0.8. But this is a small number, so it's just the area. That's a good way of thinking about it. Okay, what does the equilibrium look like? So here is a characterization of the equilibrium. So output is given by something that looks like a constant elasticity CES aggregator. This is coming from the roundabout nature of production. That's not a very important term. And this is the really critical thing, except that despite appearances, this is not a CES production function. Critically differently, for in a CS production function, these shares are constant or, or omitted, whereas here all the action is going to come from these shares. These shares are highly endogenous. As you see here, they are given by these boundaries that are going to shift around as factor prices change, as technology changes, and all of the action is going to come from here. And in fact, not even the elasticity of substitution is what it appears. The elasticity of substitution between factors is not lambda, is because there is going to be additional substitution coming from these gamma terms as task shares shift between around as you change factor prices. So it will always be greater than lambda. Wages themselves are going to have a form that's also at first familiar, but most of the action will come from the unfamiliar term. So there's a productivity. So the more productive you are, the higher are the wages. This is the cause for optimism. Most economists think that productivity increases translate into wages. That's this. In addition, there is the effect of the factor augmenting technology when lambda is close to one, that's not very important, but that's the substitution that's going along because you're becoming more productive and take, can take over some tasks. But the key is going to be this orange term, the task shares. And the labor share also is determined by task shares, in particular task shares of capital. Let me try to illustrate now 
how this model works and also introduce what we mean by automation in a slightly more formal way. So here is automation. Technology improves, for example, the productivity of capital in some tasks, psi k increases. And as a result, this orange area that used to be tasks previously performed by labor of type G now gets taken over by capital. That is what we mean by automation. Automation is the takeover of tasks by machines or algorithms. We're gonna use this terminology, change in the factor share of task share of factor G. But we put this auto here to emphasize that this is due to automation. And in particular, that's not the only reason why factor shares change. One of them that's endogenous and interesting is what we call ripple effects. And as these tasks are taken over by capital, there are fewer things for factor G to do. It's price falls. And as a result, it starts encroaching on the territory of other factors. So these are the ripple effects. Okay. Now, just to emphasize, this is very different type of technological change than factor augmenting one. Imagine we ra raise the productivity of factor or labor of type G, then this whole orange area now corresponds to higher productivity. There is no direct task displacement, but there are ripple effects. So this factor now expands into other areas because it's productivity is increased. Now, one thing we're gonna see is that automation technologies and factor augmenting technologies are going to have very, very different effects. I'm gonna come back to this. I'll probably emphasize this three times. So this is the first time. Automation technologies are going to have huge distributional effects and small productivity effects. Why? Because their productivity effects are going to be just driven by this orange area, which might not be that big, and by the cost savings from uh, allocating tasks from one to another. So when this pi G is not huge, like your cost savings could be 300%, and of course, different. But most of the time in the data, we see 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50% cost savings from automating things that's not gonna be a big productivity effect. But the distributional effects are going to be quite major because even though this orange area is not very large, it is a large fraction of what factor G used to do. That's what we saw in the first figure I showed. In contrast, this is gonna have very, very little distributional effects, but potentially big productivity effects because now a whole area is becoming more productive. All right, let me now put that in a... Uh, uh, in, in, in mathematics. So the change in wages due to automation and factor augmenting technologies can be written like this. The change in wages is a productivity effect I showed you. This term coming from factor augmenting technologies. Direct effects from task displacement plus ripple effects. But these ripple effects are going to be generally a little bit more complicated. So I'll come back to them in general at the end. And then the TFP is going to be a big effect from factor augmenting technologies and a small one coming from uh, automation. Now, in this model, factor augmenting and automation do not exhaust all types of technological changes. The other ones that are very relevant are those that increase the productivity of a factor, for example, capital in tasks that were already allocated to capital. What can be shown and we do in the paper, but I'm not gonna go through it, is that those are in, in essence equivalent to factor augmenting tech changes. So in some sense, this equation, although it's not in full generality, captures all of the main economic effects. Now, this is a single sector economy, but in the data, of course, we have multiple sectors. So in that spirit, we generalize this to multiple sectors. It is not very difficult. Every sector now has its own task share, potentially different productivities. And also there's some substitution and price effects across sectors, which we capture with a demand system. Here, I took it to be homothetic and expressed it in terms of expenditure shares as a fraction of the vector of prices. Everything else is the same. And, uh, and then you can characterize the equilibrium. There's some new effects that come become the, between sector movements, but let me not dwell on them other than 
just emphasize it in the context of the key estimating equation that we derive from this multi-sector economy. So it is this equation, and this is the one that I'm gonna estimate in a second. So the first term is a productivity effect. We saw that already, that doesn't change. The second is uh, factor augmenting changes and what we call factor uh, productivity deepening changes. Those are the ones where the productivity of a factor increases in tasks that it was already performing. In the data, this is going to be captured by linear trends by education, gender, or other characteristics you can put them in. This one's gonna be the, in the intercept and the constant, and that's why this is not identified in partial equilibrium, but we need the general equilibrium for that. Now, it, something that did not exist in the single sector economy, there is a sectoral shift induced by technological changes. So for example, if car manufacturing becomes more productive, that means that car prices are going to decline and that's going to cause more factors to be allocated to cars and the cars uh, budget shares increasing. In the, in the theory and in the data, those can be captured, oops, those can be captured by how much value added shares are changing. And in particular, the effects of that is going to be proportional to how much a given factor is earning its income in that industry. So for example, if as a result of improvements in manufacturing, the healthcare industry expands because of a BOMOL effect, Healthcare is complementary. People want to consume more healthcare. That's going to benefit the factor that specializes in healthcare, for example, postgraduate workers or nurses. So that's all captured by this term. And this we're going to directly observe in the data. So this is going to be on the right hand side of our regression. And then finally, it's direct task displacement, except that in the single sector that was just given by this change in log gamma. But now we have multiple sectors, so we have to aggregate it across sectors. And then the theory tells us that that has to be on the basis of what's going on in each sector and each factor's share in the tasks that are being automated. Okay. So in addition, I'm gonna make two more assumptions in order to estimate this model now. One is that, as I said, there are gonna be no ripple effects, which means a one-to-one -one mapping between tasks and factors. Ripple effects arise, say, for example, if uh, both Anil and I can perform the same task from two different demographic groups, and, and then I become cheaper, and then I take away that, that task from Anil, that's not going to happen here, because we're assuming that either Anil or Fazil or me can perform this task. We're, I'm going to relax this assumption in a second, in, in 15, 20 minutes, but we're going to start from there. And then the second one is that we're gonna identify the tasks that can be automated by routine tasks. That's just one possible way of doing it. In the paper, we do a variety of different ways of doing it. They're all similar, they capture similar tasks, uh, but let me focus with this one. And then we also assume that all groups performing these routine tasks are going to be displaced at the same rate. Under these assumptions, we can show that the direct displacement can be measured as the change in labor share of a sector due to automation. So we have to estimate how much the labor share of a sector is changing and how much of it is due to automation. And then the revealed comparative advantage in routine jobs in industry I of the demographic group G. And this is simply again from theory given by the wage bill share of group G in the routine tasks in industry I. And again, everything weighted up by how important is this industry for the group in question? So, uh, you know, exactly how this is derived, that will take me a longer time to explain, but I think it's intuitive. It's really like a bar tick that captures how much automation of routine tasks there is in an industry and how important are those routine tasks for you. All right, so how do we, I'm gonna focus on this preferred measure that we have, which is, we take the labor share declines of an industry and we project that on three measures of automation at the industry level. The first is what Pasquale and I had constructed, adjusted penetration of robots into that industry. So especially because of the frontier differences, changes in industry 
technology and robotics, some uh, industries have been very much impacted by robotics technology. So we capture that with this penetration of robots measure. Change in specialized software, that is very important for many non-manufacturing industries and changes in dedicated machinery services. Okay. So it's like an IV, but I won't do it more. I will do it like as more like a reduced form for transparency. All right, so without further ado, let me just say a few things. I said as already 500 demographic groups, education, gender, experience, race, and place of birth. Everything is on the baseline is from the 1980 census, data on hourly wages from the 1980 census and from the American Community Survey. So although I refer to 2016, that's actually the average of 2015, 2016 and 2017 to get enough sample size for these 500 demographic groups, some of which are quite small. Uh, industry labor share for 49 industries from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. As I said, we have this robot penetration measure. And then we also define routine jobs using the ONET data set as in my work with David Otter. About a third of jobs are routine. All right, so let me show you a couple of figures to give you a sense of the data and what's going on. And then I'll show you the regressions, the robustness, say a few words about uh, the GE and then I conclude. So here are the 49 industries. In blue, you have the change in the labor share. You see that many industries have experienced declines in labor share. It's a telltale sign of automation. They're led by mining, transport, chemical, pharmaceutical, auto, etc. And then these oranges are the component of this change in labor share driven by automation technology. And you see that they're quite positively correlated. About 50% of the overall change in labor share is explained by these automation technologies. And by the way, this is a very robust pattern. It's in the paper, I'm not gonna get into it. Whatever else you control for at the industry level of shoring, competition, monopoly, large firms, et cetera, that doesn't really change this. The, the, the biggest determinant of this decline in labor shares is automation. So there are many theories of what's going on to labor share, but as a side product here, what I'm also showing is that, you know, automation is in fact, probably the most important determinant of the declines in labor share. And here is a different way of seeing that. Uh, this is with robotics, change in labor share. You see motor vehicles, chemicals, plastics, metals are driving a lot of this decline in labor share, but robotics is not adopted in non-manufacturing. So this is a nice picture, but it doesn't capture the full variation in the automation of routine jobs. A lot of it happens in clerical jobs in offices. And here you see that with our specialized services, software services. So now restaurants, professional services, uh, computer services, and so on, are also experiencing a lot of automation of office work. Interestingly, not all manufacturing is. Apparel remains completely non-automated, for example. And this is the overall measure combining all of them. Same, very similar to the other two. Let me skip this. Here is a summary of the empirical work. So now you know this, what this task displacement measure is. These two panels are differentiated only by the fact that here I use the entire labor share decline and here I use the automation driven labor share decline. As you can see, that doesn't make much of a difference. And these patterns are very robust as I'm gonna show you in a second. But one other thing to build confidence, now I have exactly the same horizontal axis, but now on the vertical axis, I put the change in the hourly wages from 1950 to 1980, the previous 30 years. And you see that none of the patterns that I'm showing you are explained by the fact that some demographic groups are on a differential trend. In fact, that's perhaps not so surprising. It's surprising to some people, but perhaps it's not so surprising because in the first figure I showed you that many demographic groups were experiencing a similar increase in real wages. So this is the projection of that into the 500 more detailed demographic groups. Here is everything. I've said so far in a regression framework. I'm regressing the real hourly wage at the demographic group level for 500 demographic groups on this task displacement measure, here using the entire labor share, here using the automation driven labor share. They're very similar. These, what quantitatively this means I'll come back to, but already you can see about 70% of the variance is explained by this automation measure. If you put industry shifters, if you put 
if you control for uh, college premium or you know whether the group in question is female, college educated, postgraduate, high school dropout, those don't have much of an explanatory power. Female does, but doesn't change the pattern. And most importantly, as I said, the measure of task displacement has a similarity to a Bartik measure. So it's an interaction between how much a given group is specialized in routine tasks and how much the routine tasks specialization happens in industries that are experiencing labor share decline. So you could in principle separate these two things and perhaps one of them really explains all of the explanatory power of our task displacement measure. So that's what we do here. And you can see it doesn't at all. In fact, the main effects, so to speak, they're not exactly main effects, but they're like main effects, exposure to industry share by share declines and relative specialization of routine jobs themselves are not significant. And it's really their interaction. If you work in routine jobs, that's not bad news for you. If you are specialized in industries that have experienced large labor share declines like automotive, that's not bad news for you. But it's really bad news if you are specialized in like blue color tasks like assembly or welding in those jobs. That's exactly the theoretical prediction and that's exactly what happens in the data. One other thing, I hinted at this already, the educational dummies themselves have very little explanatory power. So if the st standard canonical skill bias technological change model was right, all of this explanatory power should go to education because that's what's being complemented by say computers as the older literature argued. This is very little explanatory power. All of the explanatory power is with task displacement. And this I already covered. You can do this as two stage least squares. You can also look at the effects of offshoring nothing changes is the robustness. So I'm gonna skip that except for pointing out this last column. If you look at offshoring, we construct a measure of offshoring. It has very similar effects, but we talk much more about automation than offshoring in this paper, why? Well, the logic is identical. Offshoring takes away some tasks and send them, sends them abroad. Automation takes away some tasks and gives them to machinery. But it turns out that in this period, offshoring is about one tenth as important in terms of how many tasks from how many workers are taken away. So therefore, this is a story of both automation and offshoring, but automation is the dominant force. Okay, this I've already said, uh, automation versus skill bias technological change. We actually do many, several other exercises about parameterizing skill bias technological change by different measures of skills. In all cases, very small skill bias technological change. It all seems to be about this task displacement. Now, one thing you may worry about is that at the end of the day, <clears throat> our measure of automation-driven labor share declines might proxy for other technological changes or other institutional changes or other market changes. Well, we deal with that and it turns out that really it's not about these other transformations of the technological progress process, but it's really about automation. So here I'm controlling for changes in the capital output ratio here for TFP, here in change in uh, Chinese import competition at the industry level here, here in decline in unionization. In all of these cases, exposure to these other factors is unimportant. Sometimes it's not completely unimportant, but most importantly, it neither changes the task displacement measure nor does it interact with routine jobs in the way that I've shown you for automation, which is of course key for routine. In particular, the fact that K over Y and TFP by industry doesn't have the same effect is very consistent with the theoretical framework that I presented. We cannot talk of the effects of technology. Different types of technologies have different effects and increase in TFP is not going to have the same distributional impact as automation. We do the same thing with markups. We construct many different measures of markups and concentration and none of that have much of an effect on wages of a demographic group and the impact of task displacement remains the same. Finally, we do a bunch of other things. As I said, smaller role for offshoring. If you do sub-period analysis, say from 1980 to 2000 or from 2000 to 2015, you get similar results. Uh, very interestingly, you get very similar results when you do within region analysis. So rather than doing the national analysis that I did here, we do all everything also within region. 
because in different regions, specialization patterns are different. And then you get exactly the, what the theory predicts, but I'm not going to go into those. And then we also use alternative measures of occupations that can be automated, not routine, but depending on, for example, the patent text of which specific functions patents mention. And we identify those as the ones that are going to be automated. And that gives very similar results. So in five minutes, I want to explain now what this analysis misses and how you deal with it, but I'm not going to go into the details. So at a high level, this is a characterization of the multi-sector equilibrium. You have the wages. Again, this is the productivity effect. This is the factor share. This is where all the between industry reallocation, BOMOL effects and displacement and the ripple effects are. And prices are determined endogenously and factor shares are determined endogenously. If you wanted to solve this model, it's a very complicated fixed point problem. Why? Because you have to find the boundaries for, for 500 groups across 49 industries. Everything depends on everything else. Why? Wages of a given factor is going to depend which specific tasks in a given industry are allocated to that factor. And that wages are going to affect other people's wages and so on and so forth. So doing the solving this model explicitly for sort of calibration type analysis to do general equilibrium will be very difficult. But we actually develop an alternative uh, methodology, which also may be useful. Again, I'm gonna remain a little bit high level here to give you a sense and those who are interested can read the details in the paper. Essentially what we do is that we note that if you have any shock to group G, for example, technological shock, but it could be any other shock, its effect can be decomposed into two parts. There's a direct impact, like the one that I focused on in the context of automation, and there's an indirect effect. That's where the ripple effects come in, which come from the fact that this shock changes the vector of wages, and the vector of wages changes the whole set of task allocations. But the driver is the change in log wages. But then if you rearrange this and write it in matrix notation, you'll see that this looks like a Leontief matrix that first appeared, for example, in the input-output analysis. The vector of log wages is a matrix multiplied by a vector of shocks. And then this matrix, which we call the propagation matrix, has elements that are related to the elasticities of substitution or other me measures of substitution across factors. The nice thing about this matrix is we show that it can actually be directly estimated because theoretically it, has a, it is a high dimensional matrix, but it, it has a lot of restrictions, symmetry and other restriction. So it does not have as many parameters as might first meet the eye and it can be directly estimated. And once you have that matrix, you can compute the full general equilibrium, including the productivity effects that were in the intercept as I pointed out. So let me not do that, uh, the details of that, but this is the equation that says, instead of this wage on the left-hand side and your own thing, so now you have these ripple effects coming in through this propagation matrix. Okay. So we do a particular parameterization of this, we estimate them. And let me just conclude with this slide, which gives you what comes out of it and, and sort of rounds up the full discussion. And then one more slide and then I conclude and then we can take discussions. So what this does, is that now shows the quantitative decomposition of the effects of automation. Now I'm just focusing on automation, but taking into account the full general equilibrium. The first impact of automation is productivity. Is we are in a competitive equilibrium, so automation will already be only be adopted when it increases productivity. And the productivity effect is, as you might have expected, fairly uniform across sectors. So if nothing else happened, wages for all or 500 demographic groups would have increased by about 50% over this time period, 40 log points, 50%. Now on top of it, there are BOMOL type effects, industry shifts that favor some groups, tends out to favor high education groups because they are the ones they work in like education, management, consulting, et cetera, that get an indirect boost through the reallocation of consumer budget, but it's not big. You know, all groups are around again, huddled around 50%. Here, we add the direct task displacement effect. 
Now, as a result of direct task displacement, the fact you have this hugely negative thing, especially for high school dropouts and high school graduates, especially for men. And this is the really new interesting part. And the final panel adds the ripple effect. Those are the one that work through this propagation matrix, gamma is a theta G matrix or theta G row of that matrix. And you see that the ripple effects are in some sense democratizing. They help groups that were directly affected. Why? They go and take tasks away from other groups. But as a result, they actually pull many more groups towards zero or very low wage growth. In particular, for example, women are not as much affected because a lot of the blue collar jobs that were automated did not employ that many women. But because of the ripple effects, women, especially low and middle education women are pulled down as well. Summary, when you take the general equilibrium effects, about 50% of observed weight changes are explained. The direct one was a little bit higher, 60% or so, but the ripple effects, et cetera, it goes down to 50. It explains 80% of the rise in college premium. So the college premium, which most people thought was about skill biased technological change or et cetera, almost all of it is due to automation. And it's not because college workers are complemented by machines, it's because high school workers are hurt by machines. It explains 80% of real wage declines. And this is what I was emphasizing earlier and I'll, the last time I emphasized, all of this, very little TFP gains from automation. Only 4% TFP gains from automation. There is a significant increase in TFP during this time period in the US economy, but it's caused by other technologies that don't have the same distributional effect. So this has major implications for the political economy of distribution and technology, but I'm not gonna get into those. We might touch upon some of them in Q and A. All right, that's it. So this is a new theoretical framework building on some of the work that I've done. And as you can see, it has both different theoretical implications, but empirically it has a wide variety of new aspects that seem to be a very good fit to the transformative changes in the US labor market. Some people have now started applying this to other labor markets as well. And I think there's a lot more work to be done in developing this framework and empirically uh, exploring it further. I'll stop sharing and, uh, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Evet, hocam çok teşekkürler sunum için. Şimdi soruları bekliyoruz. Eğer soru varsa kameranızı ve mikrofonunuzu açıp sorabilirsiniz ya da el kaldırarak. So if uh, if you have any questions or any comments about the presentation. So we will, yes, uh, Serkan Arnaz, so please go ahead. Uh, well, it was very nice uh, presentation, Dr. Acemoğlu, uh, and and I uh, personally thank you for such a nice contribution. I also enjoy your books. Uh, I'm a assistant professor at Yıldız Technical University in uh, the uh, computer engineering department. I have a question about the impact of uh, uh, the artificial intelligence in this process, especially when you consider we are not there yet, but especially with general purpose uh, artificial intelligence. How is that going to impact on the <clears throat> wages, especially in your model? Because we currently have task-based uh, artificial intelligence, so it impacts the automation, uh, but especially when we get to the level where we have general purpose um, and generalized artificial intelligence, how is that going to, to take into effect? That's a great question. Thank you very much, Serkan, for asking that. Uh, actually, uh, AI might change things, but I want to emphasize, and I'll let me actually share one my screen and show you one picture that's not in this presentation. But since you asked, and I think AI is very important, it's worth doing this. This is from another paper. I have written with David Otter, Pascual Restrepo, and Joe Hazel, which uses online vacancy postings for specific skills to measure AI. And you see, during the period we're looking at, there's essentially no AI at the business level. There's, of course, AI research and AI advances. It starts taking off in 2016. So for 
if you want to write a paper like this in 2025 or 2030, then how AI is impacting different types of skills is going to be critical. So some people from the beginning argued that AI is going to go into non-routine jobs that are done by managers and, uh, and more problem-solving workers. Actually, in this paper, using the vacancies data for the early spread of AI during 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20, what we find is that it's actually very correlated with routine jobs. But that might be the early phase of AI. It's also very differently distributed across sectors than I would have expected. For example, you know, services are actually quite a slow taker of AI. It's really finance, manufacturing, professional, and business services that are, are taking up AI. Retail and wholesale are also behind, but I expect retail and wholesale, for example, might be transformed by AI perhaps into from 2030 onwards, we'll see. But I think those are very interesting questions and will have to be viewed in the context of what are the capabilities of AI. Now in that context, since you are in the computer science and engineering, electrical engineering department, I'm sure you're more informed than I am, but I, I think a lot of the claims about AI are hype that I, of course, it's going to make huge advances and there will be improvements in AI, but it's not going to be as fast as people are claiming. So I think there's going to be more of a continuation of what we have, not a complete transformation. Uh, thanks for answering that question. And I agree on the, uh, the hype and the time prediction. I don't anticipate uh, it's happening in the next two decades. Uh, so general purpose AI is really going to take a long time to make an impact. So we will have to wait for that, but I think we have to be prepared for that. Of course. Thank you, Sekhan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we're waiting for uh, other questions or comments. Bu arada ben bir YouTube sayfamıza da bakayım. Orada da canlı yayında chatten bazen sorular gelebiliyor. Sema'nın bir sorusu var galiba. Ha, öyle mi? Zoom ekranı kapatmışsın da. Sema hocam buyurun. Ee, benim bir sorum yok hocam. Darun hocam çok teşekkürler. Ee, çok yoğun bir programımız olduğunu biliyorum. Ee, davetimizi kabul ettiğiniz için çok teşekkür ediyorum ben. Ben teşekkür ederim. Umarım en kısa zamanda sizi yüz yüze de burada ağırlarız. Çünkü imzalamak için kitap. Burada <gülüyor> <gülüyor> hocam. Söz veriyorum tamam. Saygılarımı iletiyorum hocam. Çok teşekkürler. Burak hocam. Siz dinliyoruz. Merhabalar. Hocam şimdi evde... Çocuk var. Dolayısıyla bağırıp çağırmaya başlayabilir. <gülüyor> Şimdi <gülüyor> özür diliyorum. <gülüyor> ee, şöyle ilgili hocam. Bu en son kitabınız Redesigning AI ile bağlantısını sormak istiyorum. Ee, yani kitabınızı okudum ve genel olarak e, hemfikir olmadığımı söylemek istiyorum. E, yani oradaki argümanınız e, teknolojik gelişmeleri kaçınılmaz olmadı. Dolayısıyla bizim onları şekillendirebileceğimiz ve sosyal yapıyı da uygun şekilde ayarlarsak istediğimiz sonuçları üretecek teknolojileri elde edebileceğimiz. Evet, ee, evet, evet, bence bu doğru değil ama e, zaten vaktimiz yok bu tartışma. Bu makaleyle bağlantılı olarak bence oradaki sorunu da işaretlen bir şey var. E, şimdi robotlaşma ile ilgili şey gösterdiğinizde, süreci gösterdiğinizde orada gözüküyor ki robotlaşmanın nereye gideceği işlerin tanımından belirleniyor. Mesela dişçi robot veya saç kesen robot diye bir şey çok zor veya imkansız. Değil Hı -hı. mi? E, ama kasiyer robot daha mümkün. Dolayısıyla mümkün olduğu zaman da gerçekleşiyor gerçekten. Ee, ondan sonra da işte kasiyerlerin, efendim e, fabrikada çalışan insanların falan hayatları değişirken buna bağlı olarak da siz de zaten detaylı olarak anlatıyorsunuz. Ücretlerin yapısının nasıl değiştiği, sosyal yapıya olan etkileri malum. Dolayısıyla süreç kaçınılmaz bir şekilde hani elimizdeki işlerin teknik doğası tarafından belirlenmiyor mu? Yani dediğim gibi işte dişçi için yapamazsınız bunu. Saç kesen için yapamazsınız ama kasiyer için yapabilirsiniz. Onlar da oluyorlar ve sonuçta da toplum değişiyor buna göre. Çünkü hemen iki kitabınızla buradaki şeyi bağladığınızda hemen aklıma geldi. Sormak istedim. Teşekkürler. Teşekkürler. Çok teşekkürler. Sağ olun. Daha detaylı olarak konuşmak isterim tabii. But let me answer in English. So you are absolutely right that certain tasks are easier to automate. 
Moreover, and I guess this is not emphasized in the current paper, but stressed in that uh, manuscript, automation has always been with us. It's not like we have a choice in automation. The choice comes in, in what else we do. So if you look at periods during which productivity growth went hand in hand with labor demand growth, including for example, in the first few decades of the 20th century, when there was rapid automation, both in factories and agriculture or in the 50s and 60s, what's critical is that there were many new tasks and many technologies that improved human productivity in certain different parts of the production process going on at the same time as the uh, automation that, as you point out, was partly inevitable. So for instance, in the 1900s in the US, you have the emergence of mass production in uh, chemical factories, mills, electric factories, but especially in the car and uh, other household durable production. So this was completely transformative because you were using technology to organize production differently and create a new set of tasks. The same thing is happens in the 1950s and 60s. And the reason why that little manuscript uh, which is sort of a, an edited book, but is with my article as the lead article. So I guess they put my name on it, uh, is focusing on redesigning AI is because of the argument that AI is very flexible. There are many different ways of developing AI. And some of those are going to be pure automation. And the redesigning is using AI for ways that are more useful for humans as well. And in fact, we actually see since, sorry, I'm giving you a long answer. We actually see this in the cross country dimension, like robots, as you say, robots, they take over welding and there's no doubt about that. But in the US, when robots take over welding, welders are fired and there's no other new jobs created for welders. In Germany, you know, welding has been even more rapidly automated, but German companies, you know, haven't completely uh, avoided some of the negative effects of automation. Labor shares have declined, but they have reassigned many of the welders to other jobs that are more supervisory and technical. And in fact, the technical workforce has increased quite a bit more rapidly in German auto automobile factories than in the US. So there are, there are choices even in the context of robotics, but not exactly whether you're gonna use robots. Once they are there, especially in things like welding, they're gonna be profitable to use. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, again for your answer. So I think uh, we have a very short time. Uh, maybe we can take uh, one more question if you have your participants. Yes, uh, Mohammed Emre Burbush. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, firstly, let me uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm a proud graduate of uh, Yildiz Tech University and an engineer of Archelik. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. It was kind of uh, much more. Uh, I'm actually an, an electric engineer, but I'm a little bit out of the economic side. So I tried to catch up all the points that I could catch. And here is my question uh, actually uh, about the outside stuff of mathematics. Um, you know, we have so, uh, humanity shame that uh, about the Ukrainian war with Russia, Russia and uh, we have pandemics over the last years. And uh, we find out that according to these two things, more of things actually, but uh, from these things, we can catch up that the world is changing with lots of dy dynamicity. So there are lots of dynamic events that changing and triggering all the actions, all the parameters. So uh, we cannot uh, imagine well uh, about the long or uh, middle term. So everything is changing. So how can we uh, predict the future? Then we can uh, 
predict the amount of wages or amounts of sectors that would grow up. Uh, as, a, as a citizen work, uh, working and living in Turkey, we, we are uh, taking the news that are shocking us every day. So everything is changing so rapidly, so dynamically. So I, want, I wonder how uh, do you think about these dynamic changes? And I think that as an also uh, interest in uh, artificial intelligence, I think artificial intelligence is not enough to catch all these predictions. So uh, even with uh, all perfect uh, design and perfect uh, data, we cannot predict everything and there will be lots of errors. So uh, I wonder, how do you think about this? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohamed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you have to think of the economy embedded in an institutional setting, in a social setting, and of course, in an international setting, and all of these things are going to have an effect. I don't think you can make stable predictions without taking that interna international uh, context into account. And in fact, you know, one thing we found, uh, both my own work and but more others work using this framework, you know, if you apply this framework to develop developed economies, it actually in other countries where we haven't, I haven't looked at the data, I wasn't motivated by them, the fit is quite good. If you go to developing economies, it starts becoming much less good because there are other transformations going on. And today we are at the cusp of, uh, you know, huge changes uh, with the war in Ukraine might take us into World War III. Uh, you know, I hope not, but but but they, it's it's it's a really critical juncture for the world, and that's going to have huge effects on profits, production, what sectors are going to work. I mean, obviously, if there is a war, that changes the sectoral composition completely. But still, even in that, you know, the right model of production and task substitution, I think, is critical. Uh, you know, if you look at, for instance, a period like World War II or or the Korean War in the U.S. economy. You know, uh, you still have to understand how the factories are working, where their demand for workers is coming from. So I think the right model is important for that, but prediction, of course, is much harder. Thank you very much for spending this hour with me. I hope I'll have an opportunity to visit Yildiz Technical University. Umarım İstanbul'a geldiğimde gelme fırsatım olur. Teşekkürler. Hayat tamamen normal dönerse, <gülüyor> bu pandemiyi tamamen elemine edersek burada da bekleriz sizi. Şu anda fazla hocamın olduğu konferans salonunda da e, yeni bir seminer çok güzel olur. Çok mutlu olduk e, biz de size ağırlamak. Teşekkürler. Rica ederim hocam. Tekrar teşekkür Adım ediyoruz. Hocam. E, teşekkür ediyoruz Sayın e, Acemoğlu'na bu güzel seminer için, e, bize katıldığı için. E, tüm katılımcılara ve Sayın Acemoğlu'na bir duyuru yapayım. Önümüzdeki hafta e, 23 Mart Çarşamba saat 16'da. 2005 e, Nobel ödülü alan Robert Aman konuğumuz olacak. Hepinizi bekliyoruz. İyi akşamlar görüşmek üzere. Çok teşekkürler. Hocam görüşmek üzere teşekkürler.